home so I may serve thee, Lord, fix my heart so that I may be by thee for I'm not worthy of all these blessings give me a clean heart And I follow thee. I'm not asking for the riches of this land. No, I'm not asking for great men to even know my name. But if you give me a clean heart so that I may be used by thee, give me a clean heart, give me a clean heart, give me a clean heart. Follow thee. Good evening, good evening. Welcome to this wonderful Wednesday evening. Shallow Missionary Baptist Church midweek service virtually. Due to COVID-19, no one's in the sanctuary, but the good news I heard from the pastor next month in April, if the Lord say the same, we will be live, all the way live one more time. So stay tuned. It's just good to be here one more time. And we sang a song, Lord, give me a clean heart so that I may be used by you. Well, let me uh, just uh, celebrate and ask you to celebrate with me. I was sharing with the production team on next week, if the Lord say the same, my wife and I will celebrate 38 years of marriage. So I'm going to take a little vacation and we're going to celebrate being married for 38 years. Guess what I've learned? I've learned to schedule my celebrations because problems will schedule themselves. And so, yeah, my wife and I, we're going to have a little getaway. And I told somebody, I met my wife when we were in college, and she was older than me when we met. And now that we've been married some uh, 37 years, so it'll be 38 years on March the 26th, she's looking younger and younger, and my hair is getting grayer and grayer. You go figure that out. But the Lord said the same, we're going to celebrate. I'm excited today. Uh, the wind is blowing here in Plano, but I realize that even a windy day is a good day. Somebody ought to get excited with me and say, it's another day's journey, and I'm glad about it. Yeah, when I look at my life and see how God, for God has brought me, I'm excited and delighted having been invited just to be here one more time. When I realized I had set my alarm clock, uh, this morning because I had some things scheduled to do and the alarm clock did not go off. 
but God touched my body one more time and I woke up right on time. Can anybody testify he's an on-time God? And he woke me up this morning and I'm excited. The real news is there were some folks that alarm clock did go off. But they did not get up because they had gone on to try a land unknown to a land of, of the dying. And, and now here it is. We are still in the land of the living. I am excited because God blessed me with another day and gave me a reasonable portion of health and strength. And I'm excited about the church sanctuary being opened but back up but I'm not gonna wait until then I'm gonna shout now I'm gonna thank God for what he's done pray with me and pray for me our father God we come now at the preaching hour we ask for preaching power Lord would you clear my mind that I think right guide my tongue that I speak right. And then, Lord, we pray for the hearers that you give them ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Come with me this evening, and I pray that I don't keep you long. I'm trying to preach uh, shorter sermons. Uh, the book of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. I want to lift up two verses, reading from the King James Version of the Bible, Ezekiel chapter 36, the verses 26 and 27 for your hearing. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. A new heart and a new spirit because the old heart was bad and stony and uh, my spirit will cause you to walk in my statue. And I want to preach uh, this afternoon on this midweek service in March. I want to speak from this thought, a new thing, a new thing. Tell somebody in the house, the preacher this week is preaching about a new thing. Well, on last Wednesday here in the state of Texas, the governor of Texas declared that the state of Texas was reopened for business. No more mask requirement. You no longer had to wear a mask. And ironically, a year ago at this same time, my wife and I left Plano, Texas, and we drove to Louisiana. We drove to Arkansas because my wife teaches school, and it was her spring break. And little did we know when we left the state of Texas and vacationed for one week in Louisiana and Arkansas that when we returned a week later, that the state of Texas would be on a lockdown due to this virus called Corona. This virus, this COVID-19 virus. And so here it is now, almost one year later to the date. And many businesses have gone out of business. Many jobs have been lost. But more devastating, many lives have been lost. And now here it is, as I preach on this Wednesday, I'm discovering that a lot of people are doing the same thing now that they were doing a year ago. And I want to say not so fast, not so fast, even though the government have declared in the state of Texas that 
No more masks are required since that declaration was made just one week ago. Over 800 lives have still been lost due to some form of this uh, COVID-19 virus. And I thought, because of that, I want to say, uh, it's up to you to do what you want to do based on that declaration. But I believe we ought to do a new thing. If we want things to be different, we ought to do some things differently. And I want to talk about a new thing, and I'm speaking, of course, from a spiritual standpoint. This sermon uh, deals with us dealing with issues. And the reality of it is just because a declaration has been made not to wear a mask, people are still dying. The border in Texas is still an issue. And just on yesterday, in Atlanta, uh, eight people lost their lives uh, due to a, a, a shooting. And the challenge is still on the table that if we're going to do better, we must do better. And you remember I said in my sermon uh, last week, just because we mess up, don't give up. And so here it is. Uh, I find myself as spring starts taking over. Even though I did not make a New Year's resolutions, I believe that I can do better. I believe I can be a better husband. I can be a better father. I believe I can be a better preacher. I believe I can be a better Christian. And the reality of it is, I've discovered that even when I know better, I don't always do better. Preach to yourself, Vaughn. Reality of it is, Paul recognized this in Romans 7 and 24. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I have become frustrated sometimes with my failure. Because even when I choose to do good, I discover that I still mess up. Am I the only one? I discover that I want to do the right thing, yet I find myself doing the wrong thing. And so I was led to the book of Ezekiel. And the truth is, I started reading last week Ezekiel chapter 37. And that's where I preach my first sermon from. I preach from Ezekiel chapter 37, and my first sermon was, Can These Bones Live? But before we get to chapter 37 and Ezekiel chapter 36, it talks about the restor restoration of Israel. It talks about a new heart and a new spirit. And from that concept, I want to set up ways that we can do better. First of all, we have to prioritize. I don't know about you, but uh, procrastination has delayed my progress many times. I've had good ideas, but I did not get my ideas in order, and I procrastinated. And so in order to get things in order, we have to write it down, Habakkuk 2 and 2. Write down the vision. Write down the vision and make it plain. And this Ezekiel chapter 36 really is the opposite of what's going to take place with the judgment from God. Even though we didn't read it, verse 24, it talks about the law says, I'm going to gather you out of all of the countries, and I'm going to bring you into your own land. He talks about regathering. In verse 25, he says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Verse 25 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will also save you. 
And so when we get things in order, we have to understand that there must be a change. If we are going to do better, there's some things we have to change. It, it could be our location. It could be our environment. It could be our atmosphere. So he says in verse 18 and 19 that I'm going to pour out a fury and scatter the people in verse 18 and 19. But then he says in the latter part, then I'll bring them back together in order for you to put yourself Put your things back together again. So remember how Paul had talked about in the New Testament that even when we desire to do good, evil is forever present. It simply says that we have retained some flaws and some deficiency and some weakness. So when we get to our text in the book of Ezekiel, how, 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 uh, do we deal with this new thing? How do we deal with being better? And I glean several things simply from the text. I pray you look at it with me. But the first thing I want to surmise for us this afternoon is we must do the right thing. Write that down, number one. We must do the right thing. In 19... 70, The Temptation released this hit song. It talks about a ball of confusion. I know I'm preaching now, but before I was preaching, it said, people moving out, people moving in. Why? Because of the color of the skin. Who? And the band plays on. Well, that was a song for the 70s, but I think it could be a song for 2021, because it talked about the war in Vietnam. It talked about segregation. It talked about drug abuse. It talked about crooked politicians that was doing things for their own interests. And I think we could preach that same text today based on what we just changed the war. But it's happening today. And here, here. Paul has said to the Corinthians, now if we are going to do better, number one, we have to do things decently and in order. When we get things in order, the Holy Spirit will guide us in the right way. He says there will be peace, there will be love, there will be healing, and there will be deliverance. So he says, if we are going to do better, there's something we must change. Yeah, we must change for the better. And that's what the application of God's word does. It makes us better. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 simply says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In other words, the Word cleans us up. The Word is what makes us better. It's God's Word. And the truth is, just like back in those days, the Word has still application for holiness is right. Joshua 24 and 15 says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we have to stand on God's word. We have to allow God's word to clean us up. All right, back to our text. Verse 25, look what it says. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols will I clean you. God here promises that he will do a good work in you if you will allow him. God says, I'll clean you up from your polluted sin. And here's the part that <laughs> brought me to realize that in my life, I had done something a week ago, and I basically said, 
okay, if I, if I get through this, I'm not going to do that again. That didn't work out. And things got better. And financially, I went and did something right again that I said I wouldn't do. And I don't know if you ever become frustrated with sin, frustrated with disobedience, because the wages of sin is death. But from the real state, that's a separation from God. But it's a consequence for our sin. And so in my own life, I looked at some things I had done and wondered why did I even go back and do it again? And I need to tell somebody that we can mess up and it's not lust. <laughs> we can mess up and it's not sex. <laughs> We can mess up and it's not going out. Sometimes we mess up simply because we know God's word, but we are disobedient, just like children. And so here, God's word is our conscience to purify us. And the grace of the Spirit sprinkled on us it's an inclination and disposition to cleanse us. That's what I talked about in last week's message. I talked about don't go chasing waterfalls, but I really was using Naaman because he dipped down and was cleansed. And just like in last week's message, God still cleanses us because Christ is our cleansing. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is help, help us to walk circumspectly in the world and be clean. Sin, remember I told you, is defiling. Idolatry is like sin. It's burdensome to us. And it's disobedient to God. But when we are forgiven, when we are pardoned, we ought to have a spirit of victory. And that's what Ezekiel chapter 36 says in verse 23. We cannot sanctify God's name unless he sanctify our heart. That's really what this message is about. That's my third point here is not, just, not only does God clean us up, but he gives us a new heart, a disposition of a mind change. God works on an inward change in order for a universal change. Yeah, instead of a stony heart, instead of an insensitive heart, instead of an inflexible heart that's not able to receive any divine impression, God says he'll give us a heart of flesh. Yeah, a soft and tender heart, conscious of itself, of any spiritual pain. <clears throat> he'll give us a heart of flesh that's able to discern pleasure and doubt. Uh, that's what David went through in Psalms 51. David had a desire for a clean heart. Look what he says in Psalms 51. He says, have mercy on me. O God, according to thy love and kindness, according to thy multitude of tender mercy, blot out my transgression and wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 10, you know it, creating me a clean heart. Oh God, renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and whatever you do. Lord, don't take your spirit from me. This is a renewing grace. This is our desire that we be 
closer to God and then we walk circumspectly in the world in order to be this way the Holy Spirit what he does he teaches he guides and he sanctifies let me say it in one more time the Holy Spirit well he teaches he guides and he sanctifies God does not force man to walk in his stature with external violence, but he causes them to walk in his stature with internal principles. Preach, Vaughn, because God is a God of principle. That's what he does. He gives us principles and precepts. And Ezekiel 36, the summation says, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you shall be my people and I will be your God. I like this. It says uh, that if you be my people, I'll be your God. This is grace personified. It's God's amazing grace showing up here, says my grace he is sufficient. He, he said, I'll be your God. Well, that's the message. But I could not close out the message without having a clear path for us to do better. If I'm going to preach the text, I must have clear indication for improvement. <laughs> When I was in the business world, working on my MBA, they told me, Byron, I had to, first of all, identify the problem. <laughs> and most of the time, we don't want to admit that we got a problem. And even though I'm preaching God's word, every now and then, I'm not always obedient to God's word. <laughs> There are times when I examine my life, I realize that I've messed up, that I've come short of his glory, that I didn't represent God in a godly way, that I did not carry myself as a man of God. And so I preached tonight, sometime out of frustration because I know I missed the mark. But thank God for his Holy Spirit that walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own and even when I don't hit the mark he lets me know there is a plan for me to do better look what I got for you tonight first of all we have to draw the line and if it sounds good that means we ought to be good but not only that we can't just sound right we have to live right not only must we live right but we have to give right that's what the text is not only must we talk straight but we must walk straight do you have any help for me yeah come with me to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and 13 it says put on the whole armor of God. And sometimes we got to realize that we lay our armor down. What, what do you mean? Uh-huh, I was talking to some parents and were telling me about their children. And uh, I said, well, wait a minute. Being a parent, I believe you spend less than one hour a day with your children let you you let uh, yet you allow your child to watch tv some three or four hours the school got them for seven to eight hours and then they come home my question is who's raising who y'all don't like me tonight he says put on the whole arm of god that means Putting on the armor, the your lines got to be girded with truth. You got to have on the breastplate of righteousness. You got to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You got to have the shield of faith. You got to have the helmet of salvation. You got to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And there has to be a complete whole armor on 
what else do you need? Well, not only do you need on his armor, there has to be some separation. If you are going to do better, you got any scripture? Yeah, I got some help here in 2 Corinthians 6 and 14, but be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness what commun communion has light with darkness in other words we got to have some separation <laughs> there's some kind of way we have to distinguish are we for God are we for the world <laughs> and our problem here is spiritual <laughs> and we must have the right spiritual conduct uh, one more scripture and I'm going to try to get out of here Matthew 12 and 30 saying he that is not with me is against me. Yeah. In other words, we got to decide uh, what side I'm on, <laughs> whose side I'm on. Uh, I'm out of here now. But can I close out by telling you, uh, don't settle for less. When God is trying to bless you with more, who am I talking to? Uh, don't settle for less. When God is trying to bless you with more, so we got to clean up uh, what we messed up. We got to put on the whole arm of God and then we have to walk in his grace and his mercy. Lamentations 3 and 22 said it's the law and mercy that we have not been consumed because his compassion faileth not. We got new mercies. We got new opportunities. If you woke up this morning, I'm here to tell you that God is allowing us to do a new thing. What do you mean? He says, I want you to renew the right spirit in your mind. What's that? You got to be led by the spirit. My mind goes back to Martin, Arkansas. Well, my dad had pastored some 38 years and they would march in on Sunday morning singing an old hymn, lead me, guide me along the way. Lord, if you lead me, I cannot stray. That's what we ought to ask the Lord to do, to lead us and guide us. And then he give us purpose. What do you mean here? He give us purpose for life. And don't put the keys of your happiness in somebody else's pocket. You got to learn how to trust the law. Even when you can't trace them, don't put the keys of your happiness in somebody else's pocket. As a man thinking, so is he. You got to learn how to trust in the law. He will be with you and give you some new thoughts, give you some new determination to give you some new strength. He'll break the chains of yesterday and give you power for a better tomorrow. Say that one more time. He'll break the chains of, of yesterday and give you power for tomorrow. I'm out of here. Good evening. Bye-bye. I conclude this message by telling you that Ezekiel is reminding us to live right and God will give you a new heart. He'll give you a new spirit. So I close this evening with the benefit of being with the law. You remember, I mentioned it earlier, but it's Joshua 24 and 15. And if it said, if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of your father served that was on the other side of the flood of the God of the Ammonites in the land which ye now live. But the position Elijah said to the people, bow down between how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. So I decided 
Yeah, that I made Jesus my choice. I decided I'm going to allow him to do a new thing in my life. I'm starting to feel good about right here because God, I serve, is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above that which I might ask a thing. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He have benefit in his new thing. His name, demons tremble. In his name, disease disappear. In his name, the wind and the way must obey him. He is conqueror of hell, death in the grave. He is Alpha, meaning that he was at the start. He is Omega, meaning that he'll be there at the end. He is the bread of life, which means when you get hungry, he'll feed you. He is living water. That means you don't ever have to be thirsty. He is the cornerstone. You ought to be able to build your hopes up on things eternal. He is Emmanuel, meaning he's God with us. He's a friend that stick closer than a brother. He's the fountain that never runs dry. He's a shield of protection. He is the buckler of provision. He is the high tower in the midst of a storm. He's my bridge over troubled water. He's my shelter when things are coming up against me. He he is my solid rock. He is my rock of ages. He is my almighty God. And the good news is, bye-bye, y'all. I got to go. But he died on a hill called Calvary. Stayed in the grave three days. And three days later, he got up from the grave with all power in his hand. And because he lives, he wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants to do a new thing in your life. Invitation is extended. We invite you to Christ. If you have not accepted him for your Lord and Savior, would you invite him in today? And those of you that may be like me, that did some investigation, inventory, and found yourself wanting. My prayer is, Lord, whatever you're going to do, don't do it without me. Still use me in your service. Still keep me near the cross. The invitation has been extended. Will you come? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus just now, just now. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus just now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you just now, just now. He will save you. He will save you just now. But you have to do something. Only trust him. The number on the screen. Only trust him. You can call our church. Only trust him just now. Just now. Only trust him. Only trust him just now. He wants to do a new thing in your life. A clean heart and the right spirit. Oh God, have mercy on us. We thank you for a new thing. Be blessed and we hope to see you soon in person. Right now, we still we're coming to you virtually. 
God bless. Pray for me and I pray for you. Good evening.